behavioral thermoregulation is king. It all comes down to temperature. It all comes down to temperature. It just reinforces the fundamental biology of fish as ectotherms. But what's truly eye-opening is the sensitivity, the tiny changes they respond to. And we see that documented so well across farms A and B. In winter, both sites showed clear thermal stratification, right? That's right. The upper water column, the UWC, was cooler, and the lower water column, the LWC, was warmer. And the fish, well, they showed a massive preference for that warmth down deep. Pump. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best? You can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Inspired by the 2025 article titled, Precision Farming in Aquaculture, Non-Invasive Monitoring of Atlantic Salmon, Salmo Salar Behavior, in response to environmental conditions in commercial sea cages for health and welfare assessment by Burke Meredith et al. Okay, let's unpack this. We are jumping straight into a fascinating piece of research from Burke, Nikolic, Fabry, and their colleagues. Mm -hmm. They've really laid out a roadmap for how we can deploy uh, precision farming tools mm -hmm. to understand what's happening with Atlantic salmon in these big commercial sea cages. This is exactly the kind of deep dive we need. We're looking way beyond just manual checks or, you know, simple biomass estimates. Right. The mission here is to get at the mechanisms. How do we take these non-invasive computer vision systems and move them from just counting fish to delivering, well, continuous and actionable metrics. And actionable is the key word. It is. We need to know how environmental conditions, temperature, wave height, how they immediately influence fish distribution and that overall shoal cohesion. That's how you assess welfare in real time. Which really gets to the core challenge, doesn't it? I mean, you're in an open water sea cage. You have incredibly variable conditions. Constantly changing. You're dealing with density, visibility problems. If we're going to build true precision systems, we need a metric that is, you know, quantifiable and totally robust in that kind of volatile environment. Precisely. And the way this research team solved it was by leveraging machine learning. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads. We elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence. Starting now. They took real-time video, fed it into an algorithm, and it outputs what they're calling a normalized relative activity score. Okay, an activity score. Right. Scale from what? Zero to 100%. Exactly. But what's really important is to understand what that score actually represents. It's not just one thing. It's a composite proxy. So it's pulling in multiple data points. Right. It's simultaneously capturing fish abundance, their swimming speed, and the overall tightness of the group, which is you know, our best measure of shoal cohesion. So we've got this powerful consolidated metric. Yeah. But, you know, for anyone looking to invest serious capital into this tech, that technical validation is everything. Can we actually trust what the algorithm is telling us? That's the critical question. And the numbers, well, they really speak for themselves on reliability. During the validation phase, they found an interclass correlation coefficient, the ICC of 0.99 wow. for absolute agreement between the algorithm and human observers. For a commercial tool, that's that's virtually perfect. A 0.99 ICC. So the algorithm is essentially seeing exactly what a trained human observer sees every single time. Every single time. And it goes further. They also found a strong correlation, an R-squared value of 0 0.70, between the human counted abundance and the algorithm's final activity score. So it's not just a research curiosity. This confirms the tool is reliable enough for real-world operational welfare assessment. It's ready for commercial settings. Okay, let's get to the findings then, because this is where the operational implications really start to take shape. Let's start with vertical movement. What was the single dominant driver telling salmon where to be in the water column? Well, the finding, while maybe not a complete surprise conceptually, is just so clear. Behavioral thermoregulation is king. It all comes down to temperature. It all comes down to temperature. It just reinforces the fundamental biology of fish as ectotherms. But what's truly eye-opening is the sensitivity, 
the tiny changes they respond to. And we see that documented so well across farms A and B. In winter, both sites showed clear thermal stratification, right? That's right. The upper water column, the UWC, was cooler, and the lower water column, the LWC, was warmer. And the fish, well, they showed a massive preference for that warmth down deep. How massive were we talking? Think about it like this. At Farm A, they recorded almost 40%, 39.6% of the total activity happening in that warmer LWC. Compare that to just 16.3% in the cooler UWC. So they basically just vacated the surface layer. They did. But here's the detail that should change how we model these sites. These salmon were detecting and actively responding to temperature differences as slight as 0.3 degrees Celsius. Wait, 0.3 degrees Celsius. That level of sensitivity is, it seems almost unbelievable. It is, but it proves they are constantly seeking that sweet spot, their preferred thermal range of about 13 to 18 degrees Celsius. Which means if your thermal model isn't capturing these tiny fluctuations, you are missing the single most critical driver of your fish's behavior. Exactly. You can't just rely on regional data. You need sensors inside the cage volume because the fish are reacting to microgradients. And PharmC gave us the perfect control case for this. The definitive counter evidence, yes. That site had thermally homogeneous water. It was all mixed, no real gradient. So the thermal cue just disappears. It disappears. And just as you'd expect, the fish distribution was pretty much even. Similar activity in both the UWC and LWC, around 18% in each. No warmer water to seek, so they just use the whole volume. Now, what about photo period? We know daylight hours can draw fish to the surface. Hmm. Did temperature still win out? Temperature remained the stronger driver, absolutely. They did see some of that expected ascension as the days got longer, but the fish at farm B still stayed deeper than at farm A. And why was that? Because even that minimal temperature difference favoring the LWC was enough to hold them down there. It overrode the natural tendency to come up with the light. Thermal comfort trumps light exposure. It's a clear hierarchy of needs. Okay, let's pivot now to external stressors, to hydrodynamics. Yeah. The study gave us this incredible natural experiment during star Misha. Yes, and the different responses based on site depth are profound. This really moves the discussion from biology into uh, site selection and risk management. We saw two completely different coping strategies. Completely different. At Farm B, the deep site, we're talking 23 to 27 meters seabed depth, the fish had a viable escape route. They just went deep. They stayed in the LWC, which was not only warmer, but also a zone where they could effectively avoid all that surface turbulence from the storm. And here is where the production metric proves the strategy worked. Their specific feeding rate, the SFR, remains stable. That SFR is the bottom line indicator, isn't it? It's consumption relative to biomass. It's everything. And at Farm B, the SFR was maintained around 0 0.80 right through the storm. They rode it out in a safe zone, and their appetite was completely unaffected. That is successful stress mitigation. Now, contrast that with Farm C, the shallow site, only 15 to 20 meters deep. So that vertical escape route was severely limited. They just couldn't get deep enough to get away from the wave action. And their behavior changed entirely. It did, because they couldn't go down. They went sideways. They relocated horizontally, moving to the side of the cage nearest the inner farm, seeking shelter from the other cages. A clear sign of stress. Yeah. And it came with a huge welfare penalty. We saw that directly in the production data. The SFR at the shallow site just, it crashed. It dropped sharply from a healthy 0.66 all the way down to 0.29 during the storm. A drop of that size is a direct, measurable impact on their growth. It's an enormous red flag. It's unequivocal. The inability to escape vertically in those shallower cages leads to much higher stress. This isn't just academic. It puts a real economic value on deeper water sites. So this brings us to the synthesis, right? The system establishes a behavioral baseline. Once you know where the fish should be, any deviation is an instant warning sign. Exactly. And it also forces us to look at the complexity within the shoal itself. The researchers noted that even in the stratified cages, you'd always have some subgroups of fish that just stayed in the middle, ignoring the warmer deep water. Which points to different stress coping styles. Precisely. You might have your reactive fish who prioritize the perceived safety of the group over the optimal temperature. Then you have the proactive fish who drive down into the LWC to get that metabolic advantage. And any automated system has to account for that kind of nuance. Which means our management response has to be just as dynamic. The authors are pretty clear that we need to move away from purely static cage systems. So we're talking about infrastructure that can respond to this real-time behavioral data. That's the future. 
Imagine a cage that can be automatically submerged deeper to follow that optimal thermal layer or shifted horizontally to avoid a current, mitigating stress before it crushes your SFR. That's the leap from reactive to truly proactive management. And that's the future this technology enables. The integration of this sophisticated computer vision with high-res environmental data is just. It's absolutely critical for hitting both productivity and welfare targets at the same time. The behavioral response is the earliest warning system you have. So we have to ask the question then, considering the clear measurable costs we saw at the shallow sites, what are the full technical and economic trade-offs for deeper site selection? And maybe more critically, how much economic value does this continuous behavioral data actually add by letting you predict and intervene before a stress event becomes catastrophic? That is the question you need to be plugging into your own operational risk profiles. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.